Introduction The euphoria of saying yes, and then spending the following months planning and preparing for your wedding day, keeps you on a sort of emotional high. This is all well and good, but once your wedding day has come and gone, the reality of settling into your new life as a married couple is staring you in the face and isn't going anywhere. No, this isn't said to scare you or make you feel as if there is nothing to look forward to, but the reality of the fact that nearly half of all marriages end in divorce sends the message that nearly every married couple needs to take great care to get their marriage off to a great start and nurture it for a lifetime. Chapter 1. The Honeymoon Leaving the church after saying I do and celebrating with family and friends is one of the most monumental moments of your life. It is at this point that you are no longer the person you were a few hours earlier. Oh, sure, you still like sushi, or not, chick flicks, and cardinal baseball. You still have the same color hair and eyes and an aversion to whatever it is you have an aversion to. But life is no longer about you. It is now about us. Yes, you will still have private thoughts and need your space from time to time, but you now belong to another, and the one you belong to belongs to you. To celebrate this monumental event, most couples take a honeymoon. A honeymoon, a brief vacation that is meant to be a celebration and a release from the nervousness and stress of planning and preparing the wedding. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. Honeymoons are often highly overrated, or rather, we have unrealistic expectations. We expect the honeymoon to be blissful, romantic, sexually charged perfection. And when this doesn't happen, one or both people end up feeling disappointed and even guilty. But why? Why would you do this to yourself? After all, you are tired. Getting married is a joyous and happy occasion and you are partnering with the love of your life. But it is nerve-wracking, and the sudden release of all that adrenaline is exhausting. You are nervous. The percentage of brides and grooms who are virgins on their wedding night is low these days, about 10 to 15 percent. It is easy to understand why someone who is still a virgin would be nervous about their wedding night. The unknown, combined with the portrayal of sex being hot, passionate ecstasy every time, is enough to give anyone a case of the jitters. And then, when it doesn't happen the way it does on television and the movies, you are filled with guilt. What did I do wrong? Will it always be this way? Is there something wrong with me because I didn't feel like that? That being what you see on television and the movies. Even for those couples who have had sex prior to their wedding night, that first time as husband and wife is supposed to be magical. Well, isn't it? You are stressed. Layovers in the airport, missed or delayed flights, cruise ship stomach bugs, foreign water issues, lost baggage, the list of what can and often does happen can go on and on. I even know a couple who got caught in one of the worst hurricanes in Mexico's history several years ago. They ended up in a motel with no electricity or running water for days, with a storm raging and destruction all around them, including looters and other not-so-nice people. Sounds like the perfect way to begin your marriage, right? So what should you do? Not take a honeymoon? No, of course not. If you have the means to take a honeymoon, then take one. Just be sure to do so realistically. Keep it simple. Even if you travel halfway around the world, you can keep it simple. Don't book more than a couple of excursions and or don't get caught up in guided tours and schedules. Take things at your own pace. Spend your time relaxing and taking in the scenery in a leisurely manner. Have fun. Just because you are married doesn't mean you can't have fun and be silly together anymore. Do something silly and playful, something like riding a roller coaster, playing miniature golf or laser tag. Being silly and having fun releases a lot of tension and puts you both back at ease. Be careful. Don't overeat get drunk, or drink water in some foreign countries, don't act recklessly and end up in the hospital or in bed for other reasons than the obvious. These things are all mood killers, to say the least. Talk. Let your spouse know if you are nervous or tired 
and extend the same mercy to your spouse. Talk about your expectations and concerns about adjusting to married life. Make memories. This is your honeymoon, so no matter where you go or what you do, make sure you enjoy just being together as Mr. and Mrs. Chapter 2. Settling in. Once the honeymoon is over and you are back in the real world, it is time to get down to the business of being husband and wife and establishing your household. The process of establishing yourselves as a married couple is actually one that requires you to take care of a fair amount of business, especially for the wife. As a new wife with a new last name, you have quite a bit of official name changing to do. You will need to change your name on driver's license, car title, lease or mortgage, bank accounts, credit cards, investment accounts, social security card, passport, insurance policies, auto, home, health, life, employment documents, 4W2s, retirement accounts, health insurance, etc. As a newly married couple, you will also need to add your spouse as owner or TOD, transfer ownership upon death, to any titled property. Name your spouse as beneficiary on life insurance policies, bank accounts, your HIPAA form, which allows your spouse to know your medical condition, and other legal documents. All of this takes time, some documents more than others, but this needs to be done as soon as possible. Some couples don't consider some of these changes to be important enough to mess with, but as you can see from the experience of others, they most definitely are worth messing with. Chantelle is a self-described military brat. By the time she was 18, she had lived in four different countries, so she obviously had a passport. But two years ago, she was married. She was all set to go on a mission trip to India, not realizing there was a lengthy process involved for getting your name changed on your passport. Chantelle ended up traveling several hundred miles to Chicago and spending hours and hours in line to get the job done with only three days to spare before leaving on her trip. Waiting cost her several hundred dollars in travel, extra fees, and so forth. Jeff and Vanessa were high school sweethearts who ended up going their separate ways and marrying other people. Nearly 30 years later, however, they were both divorced and found each other again. They enjoyed several years of being blissfully happy, but when Jeff, who seemed to be the picture of health, suffered a heart attack, Vanessa had a difficult time getting information about his condition because he'd not added her to his HIPAA. He had put his mother on there after his divorce. Thankfully, Vanessa and her mother-in-law had a solid relationship, so she was more than willing to include Vanessa in everything until Jeff was able to make the necessary changes. These are just two examples of horror stories married couples have when it comes to taking care of the business end of being a married couple. Military couples, couples who are blending families with young children, and couples who marry later in life need to be especially mindful of making this a priority. It is also worth saying that while some things will not require you to provide a copy of your marriage license, many will. So be sure to make a few copies of it so you will have what you need. Taking care of the business end of coming home as Mr. and Mrs. should definitely be on your list of priorities, but it isn't the only thing you need to do. Other tasks that should be a priority to you include Writing and sending thank you notes for all your wedding gifts. This is one of those things that some brides consider to be old-fashioned and unnecessary. Think again. It is never old-fashioned and unnecessary to formally and properly express your appreciation for a gift. Each person who presented you with a gift of any kind for your wedding spent their money and took time out of their schedule to either send you a gift or to attend your wedding and offer their best wishes in person and with a gift. Returning anything you borrowed for your wedding. Note, if anything you borrowed was damaged, you need to replace it, returning the item or items in the same condition they were when you took them into your possession. Settling into your new home. This takes time and effort, from the aspect of unpacking and arranging everything, but it also takes a tremendous amount of mental adjustment, since you are now sharing your space and your life with someone else. 
Being married is different from having a roommate. Roommates come and go, but your spouse is meant to be your spouse for life. Or welcoming your spouse into what used to be just your home. Many couples move into the house or apartment already occupied by either the groom or the bride. This is not only practical, but necessary at times in order to avoid the legal ramifications of breaking a lease. While there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing this, it is important to make sure that the newcomer is not made to feel as if they are invading the other's territory. Are you beginning to see that getting married was the easy part, and that being married is going to take effort, energy, and a lot of work from both of you? Well, it is, but it is so worth every bit of it and more. Chapter 3. Yours plus mine equals ours. Saying I do not only commits you to a life of love and companionship as husband and wife, but these words are also a declaration of your willingness to share your life, your stuff, and your space with the one you call husband or wife. You may be thinking, no big deal, I don't mind sharing. That's great, but the truth of the matter is that it really is a big deal. It's one thing to share your popcorn in the movie theater, or to say you won't have any problem clearing out some space for his or her clothes in the closet. But to actually make the place you call home one that says ours can be a bit tricky, but it doesn't have to be. The adjustments to my space or your space and what goes where in your new home will be greatly reduced if your first home as husband and wife is new to both of you. Starting out married life on neutral territory takes away any home team advantage, which removes the temptation to say things like, but I've always kept that there. Give me a few days and I'll get some closet space cleared for you. I've lived here, so I know what works best. Uh, do you really think that goes with the look I've created? We can use the shelf in the guest room for all your bowling trophies. My this and my that. Making your first home one that has never been his or hers also allows you to establish a routine and atmosphere together that works for both of you instead of just making room for the things that belong to whichever one of you was not living there previously. Come on over to my place to live. A neutral first home is definitely the best option, but let's face it, there are times when this just isn't feasible. Leases are legally binding. Location, location, location to workplaces, cheaper tax rates, safe and secure neighborhoods, and proximity to other important amenities often make retaining the house or apartment one of you has been living in the most reasonable option. If this is the case in your situation, both of you have responsibilities you need to fully embrace and live up to in order to make the transition from my place to our place as easy as possible. If you are the one who is already living in the place you both plan to call home, you need to move, shift, sort, and get rid of things you don't need in order to make room for your spouse's things before you get married. When your spouse is able to feel like they are coming home to our house right from the start, the transition is easier for both of you. Agree ahead of time what can come and what can't. Example, it's okay to say your home doesn't really have room for a hockey goal net. At the same time, however, it is important to remember that we don't have the right to expect each other to give up everything they hold dear. Compromise. Each of you needs to make a list of must-keeps, then work together to incorporate these things into your home's decor, or establish storage space for those things you agree not to display. Replace some of the decor with items that belong to both of you. This can happen thanks to the generosity of wedding gifts you receive, as well as items you pick out together. If this is your second marriage, and you are going to be living in the house one of you shared with your former spouse, the presence of the former spouse needs to be minimalized as much as possible. Pictures of your former spouse should never be displayed. The exception to this would be to allow a child to keep a picture of them and their parent in their room. And, of course, in photo albums. Clothing mementos, and possibly even the bed you shared should be removed to make way for your new life and new memories. Note. This can be especially painful 
when a former spouse has died. If this is the case, it is acceptable to keep certain things to save for your children and or as a way to tangibly remember a part of your life that was ended without your permission. What you keep and how it is kept is something you and your new spouse will need to talk about long before you say I do. No matter where the two of you decide to live, the key to merging the possessions and belongings of two lives into one household is O-R-G-A-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N. Organization. Organization not only makes finding a place to put all those wedding gifts easier, but it also serves to help you avoid stuff overload. If the two of you have been living on your own for even a short while, chances are you have both accumulated multiples of many common household items you don't need two or more of. You know, things like vacuum cleaners, irons, small kitchen appliances, and even furniture. In addition to all of that, you also have all those wonderful wedding gifts to open. And chances are, there are going to be a few things you either don't need, get multiples of, or just aren't your style. The good news is that you do not have to keep it all. Prior to the wedding and working as a team, decide which of your multiple items go and which ones stay. For example, keep the best vacuum and the furniture that works best in your home. As for wedding gifts, after opening each one and sending thank you notes, decide which ones you cannot or will not use. Exchange or return the unused gifts and sell and or donate the used items you own duplicates of. Use the money you make from selling these items to pay toward student loans, pay off debt, take a vacation, or whatever you both decide is the wisest way to spend the money. While you shouldn't drag your feet in getting it done, don't get frustrated when creating your household doesn't happen overnight. Remember, it takes a few days, possibly even weeks, of working together to get yours plus mine to equal ours. Chapter 4. Establishing a House Order The two of you have moved into your new home and are well on your way to making it a home that conveys both your individual personalities as well as who you are as a couple. Things are good. Life is great. But then payday rolls around and it is time to pay the bills and buy groceries. Oh, and why isn't that pile of laundry going down instead of up? Knowing how these things are going to be handled and who is going to handle what is something you and your spouse should have discussed in great detail prior to the wedding. Establishing a house order, as we call it, forces you to work together as a couple to decide who does what, how to handle your finances jointly, and what is and isn't acceptable when it comes to in-laws, friends, and bringing work home, and all those other little things that make up married life. If you are laughing or smiling to yourself, thinking establishing a house order is for those people, or for couples who aren't nearly as in sync as you are, think again. Establishing a house order is one of the number one ways to keep your marriage in sync and to avoid a number of issues, including arguments and fights, hurt feelings, damaged credit scores, empty cupboards, misconceptions about what is okay and what isn't, a dirty house, no clean clothes, and embarrassment. The concept of establishing a house order may also seem strange or unnecessary for those who grew up in homes where the household order is so securely established that it just happens. No, this doesn't necessarily mean yours was a June and Ward Cleaver kind of home, but it was a home in which your parents worked together to keep things running smoothly. If this describes you, you need to understand that great marriages don't just happen without a lot of work toward making them great. It takes communication and working together as a team in all things. This is also something that shouldn't wait until after the wedding to be talked about. Part of your formal premarital counseling or informal discussions and life planning conversations couples should have prior to getting married should be focused on how your household will be run. The concept of working as a team will also be strange and even one that seems impossible for young couples who've grown up in single-parent households. When you lived watching your single mom or dad juggle all the household and financial responsibilities without help from anyone else, it tends to make you a bit do-it-all-myself-like. 
If this describes you, you and your spouse will need to work extra hard prior to the wedding to establish who is going to do what and how issues such as money and in-laws will be handled. While much of what you need to decide is of a financial nature, many things are not. Let's take a look at how to handle the other things and save money issues for the next chapter. Parents. The new role parents find themselves in when their children marry is one some parents have trouble adjusting to or even accepting. Oh, sure, the classic comedy of couples versus in-laws has been the fodder for more than a few sitcoms. Everybody Loves Raymond, All in the Family, Mike and Molly, to name a few. But if you are living in the midst of in-law turmoil, or if you have parents and or in-laws who mean well, but who are overstepping their bounds, it is essential, say it with me, essential, that the two of you work together to fix this situation before it gets out of hand and people get hurt. My parents couldn't accept the fact that I was establishing a new life with my wife. They couldn't stand the thought of not having a say in my life. They thought it was insane that we didn't want to live in my grandparents' old house next door to them. No, we chose to live 30 miles away, and on our own, with 10-minute commutes for both of us every day. Things weren't too bad until we had our son. When he was born two years later, they started spying on us. Stalking is more the word. My mom started telling people my wife refused to let me or our son go see them, a lie, and started calling me crying and asking what she'd done that was bad enough for me to hate her. I tried telling her I didn't hate her and that all I wanted was for her and dad to accept that they needed to respect my family and quit lying to people. They refused to accept they had done anything wrong and that they were the victims. They even accused my in-laws, who they don't know, of trying to break up our family, our meaning my parents and I. I saw I was never going to get anywhere, so I told them not to contact us in any way until they were ready to take responsibility for their actions and acknowledge their role in this mess. That was nearly a year ago. We've not heard from them. They still drive by the house, and we've even caught them following us a few times. It's never going to get any better because they are so small-minded. I know that, and have come to terms with that. It is what it is. Michael. My mom and dad have been so supportive of my husband and I. We've been together since we were just kids, and my husband comes from a highly dysfunctional home. We don't even acknowledge his family. So my parents are pretty much his parents, too. When our daughter was born earlier this year, my mom came to spend some time to help us out. As it turns out, I went over my due date, so she was there when I went into labor. She was hanging out with us at the hospital, like she had with my siblings, and was all set to leave when it was time to actually get down to the business of delivering. But when it got to that point, it was actually my husband who asked me if it was okay for my mom to stay. I was totally all right with that, so it was the three of us who welcomed our sweet baby girl into the world. My dad is just as important to us both. We know they will always love us, give us moral and spiritual support without being nosy or bossy. We are blessed. Emily. My husband and I came from very similar backgrounds. We were both raised by parents with solid marriages and who supported our goals and dreams. They have never been intrusive or unkind. They have treated us like we are both their children and have been wonderful grandparents to our children. About a year after we got married, we moved and have not lived in the same town as they do since then, so that might have helped. But I don't think it would have made a difference. We've been very lucky. Ginny. When it comes to how often you should see your parents or how much time you spend with them, there are really no hard and fast rules to follow. Many families gather at mom and dad's for Sunday dinner every week and wouldn't have it any other way, while other couples are thankful to make it through Thanksgiving and or Christmas without any problems. Answering these questions is something you and your spouse need to do together. There are, however, some parent rules that should be observed in your marriage right from the very start. They are, never complain to your parents about your spouse. You are their child. No matter how much they like your spouse, instinct prevents them from being impartial. Don't live with your parents. Not too many generations ago, it was common for married children to live with one set of parents, especially if you were farmers. Even if you do work in the family business or are struggling to make ends meet, don't live with your parents. 
You can live next door or down the street or even in the apartment above the garage if you have to. But don't live with either set of parents. Note, the exceptions to this are military families who choose to live with parents while their spouse is deployed overseas and in the case of being a parent's caregiver. Don't face off or confront your in-laws when there is a problem. You should talk with your own parents or talk to the parents together as a couple. Never send your spouse to talk to your parents. This never ends well. Don't be too critical or too harsh. Ask yourself, is your or his mom really being nosy or are they sincerely trying to help? Is your father-in-law really trying to tell you how to run your life? Or is he trying to save you money and the stress of having the car looked at before something really goes wrong? Give it time. Just like the two of you are adjusting to being married, your parents are adjusting to being the parents of a married child. Everyone's positions in life are shifting, and sometimes all it takes is a little time to get used to things. Friends. If you are the first or among the first of your friends to get married, Making the adjustment from being single to being married may be difficult for you and your friends when it comes to spending time together and giving you and your spouse the space and privacy a married couple needs. If your friends are used to coming over unannounced at any hour of the day or night and are used to you being accessible at any time, you are going to have to lay out some clear and definitive guidelines. This may seem hurtful, and even be perceived as hurtful by some of your friends, but it must be done. You and your spouse come first. To disrespect your spouse and your marriage for a friend is never acceptable. It is now unacceptable without exception for you to go out with friends of the opposite sex without your spouse and to spend time with friends of the opposite sex without your spouse. Marriage doesn't mean you have to give your friends up and never spend time with them again, but it does mean you and your spouse need to decide, together, what the boundaries are. How often are friends welcome in your home? Are their friends not welcome in your home? Is smoking allowed in your home? Wearing dirty or greasy boots in your home? How often will you go out with your friends without your spouse? What activities with your friends, if any, will be off-limits now that you are married? Erin, quite frankly, doesn't take her marriage very seriously. She regularly goes clubbing with her single friends, girls and guys. She dresses provocatively on these events, and pictures taken on phones clearly show she isn't wearing her wedding ring when she's out. She laughs it off, telling her husband she's saving them money because guys buy her drinks. Her husband is worried about what happens when Erin goes out, but two years into the marriage, he can't seem to get through to his wife how hurtful this is to him and to their marriage. It is obvious to most everyone that this is not a healthy marriage. You cannot live a single lifestyle when you aren't single. It just doesn't work like that. Friends are important. Everyone needs a few. But you didn't take vows to love and cherish your friends, to be there no matter what for the rest of your life. Those were promises you made to your husband or your wife. Working together, though, you and your spouse will be able to make time and room for friends, both those you share and those who are your same-sex besties. Chores. Cleaning the house, doing the laundry, cooking, grocery shopping, paying the bills, picking up the dry cleaning, keeping the car in top-running condition. All of these are essentials in any household. But who does what? The division of household chores is something the two of you should decide upon as a couple before getting married. A lot of these decisions will be automatic. If one of you enjoys cooking and the other doesn't, well then, there you go. Other factors figuring into the who does what include how your parents delegated household responsibilities, what your living situation was prior to being married. Were you used to doing everything yourself? Work schedule. If one of you works nights and sleeps during the day, it only makes sense for you to not be the one picking up the dry cleaning. When it comes to deciding who does what, it shouldn't be a matter of making sure you aren't doing more than your partner is. Marriage isn't about keeping score. It's about being united and committed for the good of your marriage and household. It is also about being flexible. Who cares if it's not usually your job to mow the lawn? If your husband has been out of town on business all week, 
Why not do what you can to lighten his weekend chores so he can spend more time with you? You also want to keep in mind that your spouse won't always do things the way you do or the way you want them to. To this issue, I say, don't major in the minors. If things are getting done effectively and on time, the method really isn't all that important, is it? Setting boundaries with your parents and friends, working together to keep your household running smoothly and efficiently, and willingness to be flexible and to compromise, these are the essentials of establishing a happy and harmonious household order. Oh, and one more thing. Never, ever, ever say, that's not the way my mom or dad does it. Never. Chapter 5. Money, Money, Money Hands down, money is the number one issue couples stress, argue, and fight over. Not enough money to make ends meet. Spending too much on frivolous items. Hiding credit card debt. Living beyond your means. Racking up excessive debt. Being too tight or stingy with your money. To take the promotion or not. You name it and couples can fight about it if there is money involved in any way. So, because money is such a major issue in every marriage, we're going to take an up-close and personal approach on how to keep money from coming between you and your spouse. Transparency Susanna caught her husband cheating on her just weeks after she found out she was expecting their first child. He left hours after his infidelity was discovered and hasn't contacted Susanna since. She has done a fantastic job as a single mom to her son these past seven years. But about a year and a half ago, she met a very nice young man through a mutual friend from church. The two began to date, and seven months later he proposed. She and her son happily said yes. A month later, when the two were looking for a place to call home, a credit check revealed a huge amount of debt and prior bankruptcy. At first, he tried to deny it, but then came clean. Susanna was heartbroken, but she knew she could not marry a man who kept something like this from her, and who was obviously so irresponsible. As soon as you and your spouse become serious enough to talk marriage, you need to discuss and observe each other's spending habits. You need to be transparent about your credit and credit rating, your views on money, both spending and saving, and what your expectations are for how the two of you handle your finances. Being transparent includes revealing how much you owe on vehicles, student loans, credit cards, and any other type of loan. It involves coming clean about current and past monetary problems, as well as making your partner aware of all your investments, savings, and checking accounts, and so on. Joint accounts. One of the biggest mistakes a couple can make is to have the attitude of his money, her money. If you can trust this person with your heart, there is no reason to not trust them with your finances. Combining your finances is something that used to be taken for granted. When you got married, you opened a joint checking account and savings account, and that was that. Part of this stems from the fact that more often than not, the man was at work all day while the wife stayed home, taking care of the house and kids. He made the money. She managed it. We know this is not necessarily the norm these days, though. Most couples these days are two-income families, especially before any children are born. So, you ask, what's wrong with keeping it separate? If he has his and she has hers, won't that serve to avoid conflict? No, it won't. In fact, it makes things worse. When you have his and her bank accounts, your marriage is more like a business than a relationship. Instead of concentrating on spending wisely and making joint decisions and working together for the good of your marriage or family, you focus on making sure your part of the bills equals his or her part of the bills, so no one is doing more than their fair share. Jeremy and Julie even went so far as to get separate carts and go through separate checkout lines at the grocery store. They did have some joint meals, but they knew whose food was whose in the refrigerator and cabinets. They even paid their own checks when they went out to eat. How sad is that? Sad enough that the marriage lasted less than three years. Joint bank accounts imply trust and true cohesiveness. Joining your finances requires you to work together, to be honest about the money you spend, and forces you to work together to meet your financial goals. Hey, remember, for richer or poorer.
Joining your finances doesn't mean there's no room for flexibility. Many couples manage their money jointly by depositing all income in one account for bill paying, but have a separate account for one or both partners into which they deposit their specified amount of spending money. This actually works well because it eliminates overspending and spending money designated for necessities. Note, always keep all accounts linked together to keep spending transparent and to hold both of you accountable. Accountability. Sadly, many couples hide credit cards, bank accounts, and other financial matters from their spouse. Don't let this be you. Even if you make a mistake or find you have a weakness for overspending, don't ever keep money secrets. They never pay, pun intended. To help hold you both accountable for your finances, take the time to review your finances once every quarter. Are you saving regularly? Should you restructure your budget? Do you need to rethink your investments? Are you on target for paying off debts? Set limits on unreported spending. The money-wise couple will set a limit, $25 or so, on how much either of them can spend without discussing it with the other person. This obviously doesn't hold for grocery shopping, fixed monthly expenses, or filling the car up with gas. But for all other purchases, this is the limit. The B word. No, not the dog B word. The money B word. Budget. The value of operating within the boundaries of a budget cannot be stressed enough. Money is like potato chips. Once you eat one, you just want more and more. We know we need to spend wisely. We know we need to save for a rainy day. We know we have bills to pay. We also know eating too much pushes the numbers up on the scale. But that doesn't stop us, does it? Budgets keep you grounded. When you see your income and expenses laid out before you in black and white, it puts spending in perspective. Okay, so it can be a bit depressing too, but that's nothing compared to the anxiety that comes from the piling on of interest charges and late fees. Budgets help you meet your goals. Seeing the vacation fund or the house down payment fund growing, even a little bit, gives encouragement and determination to keep going. Budgets keep you out of trouble. If you only spend what you have to spend, you won't have to worry about getting in over your head. Budgets are meant to be reworked on occasion, when your lifestyle changes, when you get a raise, when you pay off debts. All of these are reasons you may need to review and rework your budget. Ah, money. It's not going anywhere. So do your marriage a favor and start off with like-minded attitudes, goals, and expectations for your finances. Chapter 6. Becoming a Couple The tangible aspects of marriage we've covered so far are vital for a happy, healthy marriage. None of these things matter, however, if the two of you are not emotionally, mentally, and sexually connected and committed to the relationship. The period of time spent dating and falling in love is filled with chemistry and emotion and expectation. Even the period of engagement is focused on wedding plans and blissfully laying out the future. So what happens? Why does it all seem so different once you are married? Reality happens. That's what. No matter how much you love each other and how well you plan for the future, life has a way of getting in the way. You know, you have to go to work. The rent or the mortgage doesn't go away. The electric company isn't handing out freebies, and you both still have the same personalities you both found so irresistible when you fell in love. So, what does all of this mean? It means making your marriage a happy and healthy one takes work. Talk to one another. Talk about the weather. Talk about the news. Talk about what you had for lunch today. Talk about the phone conversation you had with your mom. Talk about being in line behind a sweet little old man at the grocery store. Just talk. Communicate with each other. Tell each other you are having a bad day and why. Tell your spouse you don't feel good and that you're worried about your job or what the doctor is going to tell your dad. Tell your spouse why you are unhappy with your job or that you love your job. Tell your spouse you think your best friend is making a huge mistake by marrying so-and-so. Tell your spouse you will lose your mind if they watch one more football game this weekend. Tell your spouse you love them every single day of your lives and give them a reason why you do. Confide in your spouse. Share with your spouse that you are nervous and excited about trying for a baby. 
Share with him when your sister-in-law hurts your feelings. Share with her your hope for a promotion. Share with each other your hopes and dreams for your future. Share your fears. The way it makes you feel when you catch each other's eye across the room. And share how important your marriage is to you. 100 divided by 100. That's the equation of a marriage. In order for marriage to be healthy, you have to give 100% of yourself to its success. You cannot hold a part of yourself or your heart apart, keeping it for yourself or for someone else. You cannot keep score or hold grudges. You must be willing to forgive and move forward. Giving your whole self to your marriage is not the same as making you a doormat for one spouse to wipe their emotional feet on. Giving your whole self to your marriage does not give your spouse permission to abuse you, physically, mentally, or emotionally, or permission to be unfaithful, knowing you will always take them back. No, giving your whole self to your marriage is being fully and totally committed and expecting the same in return. Enjoy each other. Laugh together. Play together. Be quiet together. Work together. Household projects, community projects, etc. Cry together. Get involved together. Every couple needs to do things together in addition to normal daily events. They even need to do more together than just have sex. Your spouse is your life partner. The one person you have proclaimed to be the person you want to live your life with. The operative word in that statement is live. The word live is a verb, an action word. This means there needs to be activity taking place. Spend time together volunteering in your community, in your church, or in your neighborhood. Spend time together learning a new skill or hobbies that you already enjoy. Spend time watching television, visiting friends and family, and even doing things together only one of you really enjoys. Give each other some space. You are a team. The two halves become one. It is a matter of till death do you part, but that doesn't mean you are joined at the hip and should never spend time apart or enjoy activities separate from your spouse. To spend time alone and to enjoy activities alone or with same-sex friends is essential for a healthy sense of self-worth. The key is to make sure the scales lean heavily toward the time spent as a couple rather than time spent alone and that you do not get to the point of wanting time alone more than you want time together. Sex is important, but not the foundation of a marriage. The commitment to being faithful and to giving your all to the marriage is the foundation of a happy and healthy marriage. Sex is just one of the benefits of that commitment. Okay, so it's a pretty great benefit, but a benefit nonetheless. Think about it. If, for whatever reason, your spouse could never have sexual intercourse with you again, would you quit loving them? Divorce them? FYI, your answer to these questions better be no. A couple's sex life is personal, to say the least, but the subject of sex is something every couple needs to be schooled on. Lesson 1. Sex is not what is portrayed on the movies and on television. The passion and fireworks aren't always there, and climaxing is not something every woman experiences every time. Lesson 2. Good and great sex is something achieved over time. Honeymoon sex may be clumsy, awkward, quick, and even painful. Even couples who've had a fair amount of sexual experience admit newly married sex is different. There's an expectation that hasn't been there before. Lesson three. Sometimes you have sex when you aren't in the mood because your spouse wants it. That's just part of loving your spouse as much as you love yourself. Lesson four. Sex isn't always about passion. Sometimes it's about physical release. While you may not think so, this is not always a bad thing. Lesson 5. Sex is an act of love, not an invitation for love. Lesson 6. Sex is for your spouse only. Lesson 7. Just because a woman doesn't climax every time does not mean she is not sexually satisfied. Lesson 8. Not being in the mood for sex doesn't mean your marriage is in trouble. Sometimes you really do have a headache. Lesson 9. The number of times you have sex each week is not a measure of your love and devotion to each other. Lesson 10. Pleasing each other sexually is something you want to talk about. Let your partner know what you need and want. Lesson 11. 
Sex is how babies are made, so if you aren't ready to make one, use protection. Lesson 12. Letting your partner know you find them sexy and desirable and that you enjoy being intimate with them is one of the greatest gifts you can give your marriage. Connecting as a couple emotionally, mentally, and sexually are what make you husband and wife. Make them a priority each and every day. Chapter 7. The Major Decisions Married Couples Face The decisions married couples face are many and complex, dealing with in-laws, friends, household chores, and even money and sex can seem like a walk in the park when you think about some of the other decisions you are faced with. The good news is you don't have to make these decisions alone. The bad news is that you don't have to make these decisions alone. It all depends on how you look at it. The wise couple will make many of these decisions before becoming husband and wife. Doing so allows you to go into your marriage knowing how each of you feels about these matters and can save you a tremendous amount of stress and strife. But even then, a couple needs to remind themselves where they are headed as a couple. Children. The decision to have children or not, and the decision of when to have those children and how many to have, is an issue a couple must be united on. To be otherwise is to be a home divided. Making these decisions is not usually difficult for engaged and newlywed couples, but when these decisions are made for you, due to infertility, miscarriage, the death of a child, or when you have conflicting feelings about adoption and how to deal with infertility, marriages can become stressed to the max. While there is no way to truly know how you would respond to these situations, it is important to talk about how you think you may react. So if you are faced with doing so, you won't be caught completely off guard. Religion. The Bible contains warnings against being unequally yoked, being able to share your faith with your spouse and to be able to bring up your children in your religious beliefs is of great importance to many people. Don't assume you can bring someone around to your way of thinking once you are married. It rarely happens, and even then, not without strife and turmoil. Religious beliefs should be acknowledged early on in the relationship and should be shared by married couples. Prenuptial Agreements Prenuptial agreements are contracts between two people about to be married. These contracts state that if the marriage doesn't last, couples will not encroach upon each other's assets. Talk about a lack of trust. Why don't you just change your wedding vows to something like, I promise to love you and remain faithful to you as long as I feel like it. But that could change at any time, and if it does, I'm taking my stuff and hitting the road. Are you good with that? Prenuptial agreements are a clear sign of mistrust in the person you are marrying and the depth of your commitment to one another. Remember, if you are going to trust this person with your heart, you need to be able to trust them with everything else, too. Note, there is one instance in which a prenuptial agreement is a wise move to make, the marriage between two people with grown children. When a couple marries who has already raised a family and accumulated a house, savings, or investments, and family heirlooms or mementos, it is wise to take legal steps to ensure each partner's children or grandchildren receive what is rightfully theirs at some point in time. Such an agreement needs to include provisions and stipulations for what is accumulated as a married couple and what is to be done in the event one spouse requires extensive care, such as a nursing home, home care, etc. The reasons for doing so in this case help prevent hard feelings among families and to make it possible for a surviving spouse to retain ownership of certain assets when the other passes away. Couples who marry young without bringing any children into the relationship don't have these issues. Any children added to the marriage will be theirs, so the issue simply isn't there. Family Affairs It would be nice if newlyweds never had to worry about not being accepted by their spouse's family. If this were the case, no one would have a problem with the fact that when you marry someone, you marry their family. Unfortunately, for many couples, becoming part of your spouse's family is difficult, if not impossible. Families have been known to be brutal and vindictive when it comes to refusing to accept someone into their family. Parents who refuse to see their new child-in-law as good enough or suitable for their son or daughter are exhibiting extremely poor parenting skills. They may be thoroughly convinced you aren't suitable, but technically, it's not their call. 
If the two of you are committed to your relationship, that should be enough for the rest of the family. Parents who work against a child's spouse are doing nothing but creating potential problems and alienating themselves from the very children they claim to love and possibly even their future grandchildren. If this describes your situation, it is imperative that the two of you present a united front to your parents. Let them know tactfully but firmly that you will not allow this interference and that if they want to be a part of your lives, they must accept you as a couple and treat you both with love and respect. If they cannot do this, you need to distance yourself from them for the sake of your marriage. It's the leave and cleave part of your marriage vows. Children of newlyweds can wreak havoc on a marriage if the blending of two families is not handled with patience, love, and grace. It is also strongly advised to seek professional counseling and to make communication an everyday essential of your family time. Siblings and friends have also been known to drive wedges between couples. Treat these problems in the same way you handle parents who try to do the same. Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet is the ultimate story of conflicted love. It is a story we love to form a sort of kinship to, declaring our love to be so intense and true that we would defy anyone and anything to be with one another. Thankfully, few couples these days have to choose between life and death to prove the validity of their relationships to their families. But you need to love and live as if you do. Chapter 8. Valuable Resources for Newlyweds I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Marriage is hard work. But it's hard work that is worth every bit of the effort you put into it, and then some. It should also encourage you to know that you don't have to face any of the obstacles and problems that can come to any marriage without resources to help you navigate the unknown. The resources listed next are not meant to serve in place of professional counseling if your marriage is facing something too big for the two of you to handle on your own. They are meant to serve as a source of encouragement, assistance, and as a preventative measure against any problem getting out of hand. In addition to the resources listed next, don't underestimate the value of seeking advice from your minister, an older, more experienced couple whose marriage is solid and time-tested, no family members, or a professional marriage counselor. On communication, you can go to newlyweds.about.com or drphil.com, the book, The Five Languages of Love, the book, Things I Wish I'd Known Before We Got Married, the book, The Four Seasons of Marriage, the book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. All of these books are available on Amazon.com. About sex, the following books work. Passionate Marriage, The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, Love, Sex, and Happily Ever After, all also available on Amazon.com. You can go to the website webmd.com and search for sex relationships. You can also go to health.howstuffworks.com and search for relationships, marriage, and the marriage and sex dictionary. For money, you can go to the book The Total Money Makeover, the book More Than Enough, the book Financial Peace, the book Money Management and Finances for Newlyweds, the book Yes, You Can Achieve Financial Harmony, all available on Amazon.com. Conclusion Over the last several years, society has done quite a number on the value of relationships, specifically marriage. The value of exclusiveness that comes with marriage is sometimes seen as archaic and unnecessary. Don't let these naysayers get you down. Don't let their negativity cloud your vision, and rob you of the joys that come from giving yourself to someone for life and knowing they are doing the same to you. Marriage fills your heart, gives you joy, stresses you out, makes you smile, question your sanity, gives you hope, and fills you with the comforting assurance that you never have to face anything alone. It completes you. Be thankful each day that you have someone who cherishes you above all others. Take the time each day to let your spouse know how much you love them and value your relationship. Extend the love, friendship, compassion, 
and grace you wish to be extended to you. In doing so, you will be able to end each day knowing you are one day closer to having your happily ever after. The End